so we're going to be in two pieces of scripture. We're going to be in John chapter 5, and then we're also going to be in uh, Romans chapter 1. But before we do that, permit me to pray for our time together. Um, and then depending on where we go and how we navigate through it, I actually might open up to some questions. Um, we've never done that before, but I think it'll be really good. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Uh, you're a good father. You're merciful. You're gracious to us. Lord, I pray that as we unpack your word now, uh, that you would make it plain to us, uh, that we would uh, see it for all that it is. Um, we love you, Lord. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's why I felt led to share this piece of scripture. Um, as we navigate through the series that we've titled, We Are All Theologians, um, looking at different doctrines, looking at uh, different truths that we find in God's word, uh, I wanted to make sure that we don't get lost in all of it. Um, we're uncovering some pretty deep theological things. Uh, we've looked at uh, justification by faith alone. Uh, last week, we looked at propitiation. Uh, um, people were telling me that, that, man, I didn't even know that that word existed. Um, and, and so some, some really big things, and, and there's more to come. Uh, this is a series that we will continue to do uh, throughout the years, every now and then just p picking up uh, some scripture and, and navigating through it and looking at, at what the Bible uh, is saying about who God is and what that means for us. Some really important theological truths that I believe if you are a Christian, you should know. All right? And so we're going to unpack eschatology. That's going to be a, a big one. Ecclesiology, we'll look into. Sanctification, we'll talk about. Regeneration, all, all of these beautiful things that we find in God's word. But I don't want us to get lost in all of this. Because many of us do. Many of us do. We end up holding up these, these doctrines, elevating them to places that they don't belong. My hope is that I've shown you in this sermon series that even as we unpack all these things, they all point to Jesus. That, that if it doesn't end up with Jesus, then we've made a horrendous mistake. And so in our text, we're going to see that that there were a few people who had done that, and in doing so, completely missing Jesus. And so if you have a Bible, you can meet me in John chapter 5. That's where we will be this morning. We, we find Jesus uh, engaging with some Jewish people. Uh, this was not uncommon to Jesus' ministry. He would regularly find himself speaking to Jewish people and wrestling with them. And so here we, we find him doing that very thing. It almost feels like he's in a court room, that he's having to give evidence for the fact that he is who he says he is. Because people are just saying there is, there is no ways, there is no ways that you, you could be the son of God. See, what he's doing is he's saying, guys, the father and I are one. The father and I are one. We are one in nature. One in power, one in authority. And, and so that, that was just messing with their brains. They were just like, there is, there is no ways. As they look at Jesus, there was like, there's just no ways that you could be the son of God. And so he's going, okay, then, then let me give you some testimonies. Some testimonies that, that verify that I am who I say I am. And so uh, if we read John 1 all the way to John 5, there's, there's four Four witnesses that Jesus brings to stand before the people and say, okay, look, li listen to them. If you're not going to believe my words, then listen to them. And so let me walk through th those four real quick, and then we'll land on the last one and then unpack it a little bit. The first witness that Jesus brings before them is, is John the Baptist. He says to them, you, you guys have been listening to John the Baptist but, but why will you not believe him on this matter? See, John the Baptist was considered the last prophet before Jesus. That, that as we look through the Old Testament, we see all these prophets that had, that had come before Jesus. John the Baptist was the final one. He had come to prepare the way for Jesus. The text tells us this. And so Jesus is saying, you, you guys, you believe John on so many different things, but, but now he, he's just testifying about me. Why will you not believe that? The second witness that Jesus brings before them is 
the signs and wonders, the miracles that he was performing. He was like, well, you've read the Old Testament and, and you know that there's one who's coming and would perform all these miracles. Have I not proven to you that I am the Son of God? You just simply have to look at the signs and wonders and see that they, that they reveal who I am. And still you refuse to believe. Okay? The third witness who I think, I mean, if just hearing from this witness alone, they should have fallen to their knees and gone, okay, we worship. The third witness being God himself. He, he says, you, you've heard from God. Some of you heard from God. I was baptized and you heard the very voice of God saying, this is my son. In him I am well pleased. Surely that would be enough. Later, we, we, the same thing happens at the transfiguration where the voice of God is heard and he, he says, this is my son. And still, and still they don't believe. Just Jewish practice back then, you only needed to bring two witnesses. And Jesus, he brings four, he doubles it. He's just going, guys, look, I, I, could, I could spend the whole day just unpacking, unpacking, testimony after testimony after testimony, revealing who I am. So we get John the Baptist, we get the signs and wonders, we get God himself, and then the fourth witness that Jesus brings before them is God's word. And so let me read to you John chapter 5 from verse 39. The Christian Standard Bible says it this way, you pour over the scriptures. Some translations say you diligently study the scriptures. You pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them. And yet they testify about me. But you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. He's speaking to people who would have called themselves theologians. People who, who would have said, no, I, I, I know the scriptures. In fact, many of them would have known way more than we do today. They would have spent day after day after day meditating on God's word. And so because of that, they, they stand and they go, because we know all this theology, we have eternal life. And Jesus says to them, no, no, hold on, you've completely missed it. You've co completely missed it. You, you think be, because you know all of this, that you have eternal life. See, that's the difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And that's what he exposes. He says, guys, all of this, all of this is pointing to me. All of it is pointing to me. It, it speaks of me. Why? Because only in me can you find eternal life. And yet I believe, and I think our church could run the danger of this, that many of us, we go, you know, if I know this theology, if I know this doctrine, if I can unpack this, it's all about the mind and we forget the heart. It's great to know all these things, but if you do not have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ himself, you will not get eternal life. And that's what he's saying to them. He's looking at them and he's saying, guys, I know you know these things. In his ministry, he would often say, you've heard it said. And many of them would go, yeah, yeah, we do. Because we've read it and we've memorized it. If Jesus was here today, you've heard it said. I think many of us would go, hey, where, where did he, is it really, is it really? So these guys are like, these guys are true theologians. And yet he says to them, you won't even come to me. You won't even come to me. You, you've accepted the written word but you're refusing the living word. And oh, how so many of us could fall into that trap, accepting the written word, which is good, but it points to the living word. How, how, how do you know this? John chapter one. John writes, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He's speaking of Jesus. If you jump down to verse 14 of that same chapter, it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's saying the Word points to Jesus. 
And so everything that we do as we mine God's word and as we look at these beautiful theological truths, we've got to realize that all of it is pointing to Jesus. This is why some pastors will say this, that, that as you unpack the scriptures, you must always try to figure out what is this saying about Jesus? How is this pointing us to Jesus? How is this helping us understand who Jesus is so that we might experience this relationship with him? But Jesus doesn't stop there with them. He continues. He says in verse 41, I do not accept glory from people, but I know you, that you have no love for God. Can you imagine that? Speaking to theologians, people who go, no, 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 we know God. We have a relationship with God because of all that we mentally know. And then Jesus comes and exposes them and he says, you know what the issue is? You have no love for God. What? Can, can, do you not see our degrees, our theological degrees? Do you not see the books on our shelves? And he goes, no, no, no. You have no love for God. No love for God within you. I have come in my Father's name and yet you don't accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another but don't seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your accuser is Moses. Again, another startling like, what did you just say? Because, because Moses is a hero in our faith. He, he's one of the fathers of our faith. He's, he's the theologian of theologians. I mean, he, he wrote the law, and yet they're going, no, Jesus goes, no, I, I, it's not me. There's one who accuses you before me. It's Moses. Your accuser is Moses on whom you have set your hope. Jesus is making the point here again that, that everything that Moses wrote, all, all the 600 plus laws that were written, everything that you have read and studied and meditated on and memorized, all of that is pointing to me. I'll give you one example. It's Moses who sets in place, because of what God says to him, the whole Passover lamb. Moses sets that in place. And then generation after generation after generation, that's what they do. And then John the Baptist shows up, the last prophet, looks at Jesus and says, here is the lamb of God here to take away the sins of the world. Like he, for, for, for John the Baptist, it just made sense. He went, everything that I've read is now pointing to Jesus. Here is Jesus. That everything that we have been doing, here it is now. And so he says, it's Moses who accuses you. You read his words and here I am. Everything that has been promised now being fulfilled right here in front of you and still, still. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me because you wrote about me. But if you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe in my words? Jesus takes it even further back and he goes, you know what, you don't believe in me. Actually, it's revealing that you actually don't even believe what you have read. Because what you've done is you've taken it and you've used it as a way of, of building yourself up and saying hey, to people, look, look at me, look at how much I know. Look at how much I intellectually know, completely missing the fact that it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. And so as we navigate through this series, that's, that's the point. That's the point of why we are all theologians, why we're taking time to unpack this, is because I want you to see that all of it points to Jesus. The good news is Jesus. He is the good news. Oh, but what about all these other things? You know what those things are like? They're like being a part of a program and then having all these benefits. And so the reason we're taking time to unpack these benefits is because I want you to understand what it is that you have in Jesus. Uh, this recently happened to me. I, I had uh, the, the Burger King app. Anybody else have the Burger King app? If you don't, you should 100% get it. It's incredible. Unless you don't need Burger King and you're judging me for that, then that's totally fine. Um, but, but I had the Burger King app and I downloaded it because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of those guys. It's like uh, you go to KFC and you buy uh, a KFC meal. I don't eat KFC, um, but I buy for others. Just want to put that out there. Uh, and you, you buy a KFC uh, meal and then they say to you, will you donate two rand? 
I'm that guy that always goes, ah, oh, sure, sure. Uh, let's just go ahead and do it. You know, I feel bad. I really do. But same thing, Burger King, can you download this app? Ah, oh, sure, I'll, I'll quickly do it. And I never opened it. But I had the app. I possessed it. I possessed the Burger King app in, like, on my phone, but I, I just never opened it. And then one day I just thought to myself, you know what, let me, let me see what's in here. Opened it and realized how I had missed out on so many benefits. Discounts. Buy one, get one free. I was like, what? How, how did I not know about this? This is why we unpack all that we're going to look at in the Why We Are All Theologians series. But here's the thing, none of those benefits, they mean absolutely nothing to you if you don't have Jesus in your life. And so my hope is, is to always point you to Jesus, is to remind you that you need to surrender your life to Him. And if you don't, if you're not willing to see Jesus for who He is, the Bible says this, it is because you have no love for God. It's a harsh thing to say, but it's true. It's because you have no love for God. Here's what Paul says in Romans. We started our We Are All Theologian series with this piece of scripture, Romans chapter one, verse 16, a well-known piece of scripture. It says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. That's what Paul is saying. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. But then he goes on to say this, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it was written, the righteous will live by faith. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness, hear this word, suppress, suppress the truth. To suppress the truth is to hold it down. It's like going into a pool and taking one of those balls and, and trying to push it under the water. That's what we do with God's word. Ultimately, that's what we do with God's truth. That's what we do with the gospel. Now, now, I know many of us will go, but no, oh no hold on, I, there's things that I didn't know, there's things, there's things that I was unaware of. Like, that was me. Before surrendering my life to Christ, I, like, I'm just being blown away by who Jesus is as I cross the line of faith, and I look back on my life and I go, like, after reading this, going, how, how was I suppressing the truth? I didn't know. But I'm gonna read you some verses now that will reveal that it's, it's not because we were un informed, it was because we were unwilling. We were suppressing the truth. He says, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. Where? For his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen in creation, in the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. Paul is saying that we should be able to look to creation and go, you know what, there must be a creator. I may not know who he is, but, my, but my, my heart is telling me that there is someone who created. And the hope is that that would begin the search for truth. Not a suppressing of the truth, but a searching for truth. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God and show gratitude, instead, their thinking became worthless and their, and their senseless hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise. These theologians standing before Jesus, claiming to be wise. Many of us claiming to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals and reptiles. How many of us we've, ex we've exchanged, we've exchanged the one who is seated on his throne, fully in control, worthy of all worship and glory for things that we've created, for Instagram and TikTok, for budgets and schedules, for accolades and titles. We suppress the truth. Therefore God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie 
and worshiped and served what has been created instead of the creator who praised, who is praised forever. Amen. And so I want us to be absolutely clear as Rooted Fellowship that, that we talk some big things we unpack some big theological truths. We swim through God's word. I love the fact that here at Rooted Fellowship, when anyone ever stands up here, literally they unpack God's word. They're unashamed of God's word. They go through it. We don't skip anything. One of, one of the reasons that we like to preach through the, the books of the Bible verse by verse is because we don't want to skip some of the difficult things that are in here. There's a lot of churches that will go, you know what, skip that, skip that, skip that, skip that. Let's just talk about the things that everyone will be comfortable with and agree with where we go, no, we believe all of God's word is God breathed. But it doesn't end there. All of God's word points to Jesus. That's why the gospel is not just information, it's also invitation. And so as you make gospel presentations where you live, work, and play, as you share Jesus with other people, give information, but also make an invitation. Inviting people to Jesus, to experience him. My fear is that we leave people with information, with big theological truths, and they walk away believing, I am saved and I have eternal life. When in reality, you've completely missed it. You continue to suppress the truth and you worship the created things and not the creator. Now this has massive implications for us in many ways, many, many ways. Um, it helps us figure out how to share the gospel, which is something I think all of us should do. If you're a Christian, if you've crossed the line of faith, you should share the gospel. And I, and I, and I hear a lot of you know excuses and, 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 and no excuses, um, and I'm the same, I'm the same. I'll say to myself, I'm an introvert, uh, but it doesn't take too long for me to open up my mouth and start talking if we're gonna talk about comic books and movies. I'm quick to share about that. We all have that thing that we love to share, that we're very passionate about. And so if you're a Christian, that thing should be Jesus and what he has done for you. And so as we share that with people, we're sharing it to a world that is suppressing the truth. Which means that in each and every single one of us, because we are created in the image of God, there is a desire to know the truth, but we suppress it. And we suppress it with different things, with, with hurt and pain and shame and guilt and, 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 and the lust for things. And, and I get it, but we suppress the truth. And so if that is true, as Paul says, that we should be able to look and go, you know what, there is a creator. Even the person who says there is no God, there is a opportunity and a place for you to speak truth into their lives and allow them to experience who Jesus is. This is why we do the series, We Are All Theologians. Because this is not the single role and responsibility of the person that stands here on a Sunday, but as theologians, as we leave and we are scattered throughout the city and beyond, we walk around going, we have so much to share because of what Christ has done in and through us. But as the world continues to tick over and over and as things change, things I believe become harder and harder and harder to speak this truth. We, we become Outsiders, we're attacked for what we believe. Words are said about us, but that should never, never, never cause us to hide away and, and keep this to ourselves, but rather we should go, no, 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 no. The world is suppressing the truth just like I was once upon a time, but the light of the gospel came in and I saw Jesus for who he was, the wonder of God. And that allowed me to enter into a relationship with God. And, and so if that is true, then that means that no one is beyond the grace of God. And I know that there are many of us in here, we think of categories where we go, they're just beyond God's grace. It's, it's not even worth sharing the gospel to them. No one, no one is beyond the grace of God. I want to take us to Psalm 78, 
because I believe Paul shares this in light of Psalm 78. Um, but I, I'm not gonna do that now. In fact, what I, what I would rather do with the brief time that we have left um, is, actually, is actually open up for some Q&A. Uh, we've never done this before. Uh, I don't have the mic. Uh, we've never done this before, and, and so I have no idea where this will go. Um, but it could literally be about anything. We could go all the way back to the first sermon that was preached on the series where we spoke about the glory of God. That only God is worthy of glory. And, and what that means for us as, as glory thieves, because that's what we do. And, and even with that, God sends his son to come and die for us. He sends the good news, he sends Jesus, the gospel. And so we unpack that and then uh, the second part was justification by faith alone. Um, and then last week we looked at propitiation, uh, the, the, the price that satisfied, we looked at the blood of Jesus and the benefits of the blood of Jesus, what we gain because we are covered in his blood. And, and then this morning, again, it's, it's just wanting to remind us why we do this. Many of you diligently study the word of God. But my fear, my fear is that many of us miss it. We, we study it and we miss Jesus. And that everything, everything points to him. Everything. That if you decide to find another church or you move and you have to find another church somewhere and you listen to preaching, my hope as a theologian, one who is constantly studying God's word, every time you hear a sermon preached, you go, okay, this is, this is good. He's using great theological terms and he's tying it all together, but show me Jesus. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have the mic, roam around, lift your hand, Mo will be there. Um, and let's, let's, just, let's just ask some questions. Like I said, it could be on anything that we've covered. Um, in fact, I'd go as far as to say it could be anything uh, about who we are as well, uh, because uh, we seek to anchor ourselves in the gospel. Um, and so if there's something that you're wondering why we do this, why we do that, um, I'd love to answer it and hopefully uh, show you that it, in some way it's pointing to Jesus. Um, and then there may be some things, let me just put this out there. There may be some things that you ask and I go, that's a really great question, I don't know. That might be shocking to some of you guys, but there's a lot of things I don't know. Um, but I'm committed to study and search so that we might know together. Uh, and then lastly, I'll say there's some things where I'll go, that's a great question. Um, I don't think it's one that we can maybe unpack right now. I may give you a few sentences, but I'd love to grab a coffee with you and, and chat about it. And so at the very least, you get a free coffee. Um, is that cool? Let's go for it. Oh, right out the gates. Thanks, Pastor Oni. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could say something about, what, I believe that we are called all to be theologians, mm -hmm. so this series is amazing, but maybe you could say something about the difference between studying God's word and preparing a sermon, because often I think that uh, as a believer, we can sometimes be intimidated by thinking, oh, do I need to prepare a sermon? So maybe can you just speak into the difference between preparing a sermon, like what you do yeah. and what we're called to do? Yeah, very good. Um, I want to say this real quick right out the gates that I recognize that everyone is different. So how we study God's word is different for everyone. Um, people have different tools and practices, um, and so you should use those. And if you don't have any, please come speak to me. I'd love to get some tools in your hand um, because this, this, is, this can be very difficult. Uh, I remember I, I became a Christian um, by simply reading Romans. Uh, the Bible was handed to me. I, I walked into a room and I said, I want to become a Christian. Or I said, I think I want to become a Christian. And the guy thought I was joking, and so he handed me his Bible and said, go read the book of Romans. And I went and read it and got to the portion where if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. And so I said, well, I'm confessing and believing, and so I believe that I am saved. Um, and then after that was like, okay, I've never read this book before in my life. Where do I begin? What do I do? What do these numbers mean and chapters? And what it, why is it put this way? Old Testament, New Testament. Um, so we wanna put some tools in your hand. Um, but the, on your question, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a great temptation because, and I think it's a great temptation for any teacher and preacher of God's word. Um, I would go as far as to say any leader is that oftentimes we prepare God's word uh, starting with the question, God, what is it that you wanna say to them? Right? What, what is it that you wanna say? What, what, like, like what, what golden nuggets do you, do, you want, do you want me to put before them? 
I think that's a good question. I don't think it should be the first question. The first question is, God, what are you saying to me? And so I say this, I always want to preach out of devotion because I've spent time with God. I've sat under his word and, 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 and I've seen uh, the fact that he is holy and he is worthy of all praise and then also I have seen my own sin. And so when I stand up here, oftentimes it's really hard. I've said this to a few people and someone actually once asked me um, why I said what I said and I'll say it now and that is Saturday is the hardest day for me during the week. Don't wanna make this about me, just answering the question. Saturday is the hardest day for me because it's the day where I am, I am filled with what it is that God has said to me and then what he's wanting to say to you. Um, and yet at the same time, I'm, I'm also recognizing my own sin, right? And, and so I'm like, how on earth can I stand up in front of these people? Like the, the sin that I have committed just this week, my impatience, my, my anger, my frustration, my, my like, how dare I stand up and then say all these things to people? And it's in that moment I've got to recognize that God's grace also covers me. And, and so I, I would say, when you study God's word, come to it out of devotion and always ask the question, God, what is it that you're saying to me? What does this say about you? And then how do I respond to you in light of what it says? And so God, would you reveal some things to me? It's, there's a lot of prayers that I like to say, uh, you should be careful to pray. <clears throat> um, one of them is fire come down from heaven. Be very careful about that one. Um, uh, break my heart for what breaks yours. Also, be very, very careful. Um, but a, a big one, as you're studying God's word, is um, God help me to see me for me. That's where my, my deep insecurities live there. Um, and, and, and I know God's word covers those. So I would say that. Yep. Anyone else? Oh. Boom, 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 boom. I see you. We'll take him. Yep. Cool. Um, yo, this is loud. Um, on one of the same ones, when we're talking about justification by faith, yeah. there was that verse in Genesis where it says, uh, and it was credited to him for yeah. righteousness. Yeah. And then I think you said something like, this it doesn't refer to faith. But then when we read from Romans, it's like his faith was credited for righteousness. I didn't quite get why okay. you'd say that it refers to something else. So you're saying it was said, Abraham, speaking of Abraham, he believed and righteousness was credited to him, right? And then you're saying in Romans it said, what's the difference that you're saying? It says his faith was credited as righteousness. Mm -hmm. Um, so I thought it meant his faith. Got you. Yep, I hear what you're saying. And I actually then came and said, it's not, it's not the it. The it, we assume that the it, um, I just want to read it because I wrote it. Uh, here's the point that I was making, and I believe the, the Bible makes the same point. Um, because at first glance, that it can come across as if it's talking about Abraham's faith. Um, but that what that does is, is it makes us then believe that the exchange, like that's what, like God looked at Abraham and said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna exchange what you have for what I have. But, but we have nothing. Abraham has nothing. Go for it. I see you have a question. You wanna follow that up? Um, but Abraham has faith. And it's not his faith because we know faith comes from hearing the word yes. of God. So, he can't be proud of it. It's yes. God so, has given him that faith. So faith, faith. Is, is the means by which we receive. Yes. So it's that, it's that faith that he's been given? Yes. That's taking part in this process. 100%. So faith is this. Yes. So it's still that faith that he has been given? 100%. That is being created as righteousness. Yes. But then we're saying it is not faith. So, 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 else. so the it, so faith is the means by which we receive, right? This is why James says, faith without works is dead. So, so faith is, is this, this posture. It's, it's a posture. It's a, a posture of the heart. And I would go as far as to say, not just of the heart, but a posture of our body. This is why it matters. That's why when people go, no, but I'm, I'm just, I'm worshiping in my heart. It's like, okay, cool. 
but you've also got to, you've got to your whole body has got to experience this, it's got to reveal this. You read Acts chapter four, um, Peter and I believe it's John, they, they go to the temple and they find a man there, right? And he's crying out, he's crying out for money and gold and he's, he's just crying out, he, he needs some stuff and, and they say to him, um, silver and gold, I have none. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Now, if you read the text, he stretched out his hand. There's the, there's, there's the faith. Pulled him up. That could have ended badly. Like he could have lifted him up, let go, and the man could have just collapsed. Right? But the faith is the hand that's been stretched out to go, I'm believing. I'm believe, but, but I'm not believing in my hand. I'm believing in the one that I'm putting my faith in, the one that I'm trusting. So, so that's the point that I was making. And that's the point that I believe Genesis is making and interpreted by Paul in Romans. And I think that's how we are to understand faith. But I think too often when we talk about faith, my faith saved me, which is a biblical phrase. It's in the Bible. But it's Jesus who saved me. Right? My faith, another way to say it is my faith in Jesus saved me. But if you stop with my faith saved me, you run the danger of believing that it's, it's what I do. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's fine. Um, I think that's, for me, it's just, it's your faith in Jesus. 100%. Yes, I think when we, it seems to come across that it's not faith. It's like, so as long as your so, faith is part of the component, no, I, I, it's in I, Jesus and it's part of the... And I 100%, faith. I just want to say this real quick and then try to, because it could be a longer conversation, but... Um, what I wanted to do is to go, who does the saving? Who, who, who does the saving? Okay, so, so how do I get saved? I believe in what? That he did what? So, 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 so again, the focal point, and it's what Jesus is saying, is like in James chapter five, it's like, you guys, you study all this stuff, but you don't realize that it's me that's doing it. It's me that's doing the saving. So put your faith in me, and never wanting to separate our faith from, from Christ. I'm agreeing with you 100%. I, I just feel that we run the danger of removing Jesus, and then it's about my faith. Then it becomes about how much faith do I have so that God can do for me? That's dangerous. Because even when you start praying for people and you're going, well, it's, you've heard it. It's because you didn't have enough faith. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, in many instances, we have seen theologians who have great doctrines, but that does not translate into love and justice for neighbor. Mm. And I think from what you said, it could be translated that they've missed Jesus. So how does such thing happen? And one, what can one do to guard their hearts against it? Yeah, it's great. That's a, that's a tricky one. Um, one, we'd have to unpack what we mean by social justice because I think there's many definitions out there that have made things very, very murky. I said justice, not social justice. Oh, okay, sorry, then, then, then that's my bad. Okay, so we're talking about justice. Well, justice and righteousness are the foundation of God's throne. So on that fact already, you cannot remove justice. Um, the, the, the fact that God's wrath is poured out on Jesus um, is because he's a just God. Uh, justice must be fulfilled. Um, if, if he doesn't, if he sweeps it under the rug, then I, I particularly don't think that's a God that we want to serve because it's like, well, now it becomes, well, you, you swept, he's under the rug, but you didn't sweep mine, what, what's going on? Um, so, so justice is a real thing. And, and so the implication of that is us as people, uh, we want to be righteous and we want, we want justice um, because that flows from our Father. And, and that justice is, is social. So this is why I entered the word social, because it requires people. We are people, we, we're people in social environments. Injustice happens socially. And so when people go, well, it's not about social justice, I go, I get what you're saying, because you're probably understanding that from a definition that comes from some textbook somewhere, and that's got nothing to do with God. I totally get it. But I still, I can't remove the fact that, that Moses wrote tons of laws in Leviticus that speak to justice socially. 
that when this happens, then this must happen to rectify this, to restore this, to heal this, to bring, you know what I mean? Like, so, and, and that comes from the fact that God himself is a God of justice because he wants to socially reconcile with us. But for that to happen, there must be justice. And so instead of that being poured out on each and every one of us, it's poured out on Jesus. And so in Christ, that's why I believe in the community of God. That's where we should find the best justice. But we don't. This is why Paul writes in Corinthians, that some of you guys, you're going to the courts, like, like society, why are you doing that? Like you should be able to handle this on your own because we serve a God of justice. And all of that has been poured out on Jesus. So it compels us, I believe it compels us to be a just community, but to do so according to how God has told us to do it. I don't know if that answers. You, you look phased. I, I need a nod or a disagreement. I'm happy for you to disagree. No, I said that we get theologians uh, who have great doctrines, but does not translate into loving neighbor and, and justice. How does such thing happen? Oh, okay. And how do we prevent it? It's when it stays mentally here. One of the hardest things to do is live in community. It's difficult. You, you think you're a patient person until you live in community. You think you're a gracious person until you live in community. You think you're fair until you live in community. And, and the more diverse, the harder it becomes. And so I think what people tend to do is to go, it's just easier to live in my head and in my library and on my desk, and then I can say all these things, but I never really have to enter into the difficult places of humanity. I think that's how it happens. Because when I read it, I read it with, like when they share it, I'll go, great truth, but it lacks grace. And it, I feel like it lacks grace because you haven't met a single mom. You haven't met someone who's gone through abuse. You, you haven't met the injustices that we've experienced. As well. Like you just haven't, you, like I don't think you've spent time with someone who goes, look, I hear that truth, but how do I love my enemy? Jesus says we should, but how do I, do? you have no idea what my enemy has done to me. And so you gotta swim through that. So I think that's how it happens. And how do we prevent it? Get in community. That's why I'm an advocate of community. Get in community, because it's so easy to be like, well, you guys don't do this. Well, it's not as easy as you think. We have a simple gospel for salvation and a complex gospel for sanctification because we live in complex environments, but that gospel is able to engage those things. So, yeah. I think I saw a hand here and a hand here. I promise I'm gonna go quicker. Or did I see it at the back? There's definitely a hand here. Oh, go here? Okay, simple. And then I'd love to hear from a lady. Um. We are theologians. Um, I struggle with, um, and I may be wrong historically, yeah. um, that a lot of ideas that we, we engage with when we talk about theology and theologians is, yeah. is European and, and, and Euro-American. Um, and we, we barely, barely hear what other contexts say, mm. uh, read scripture, how they read scripture. So the building and, and, and compilation of, of doctrines and, and how they come to us, they come through particular lenses and um, we don't see to seem to experience ourselves in the reading of, or the compilation of, or teaching of particular theologies. Yeah. How do we better contextualize where we are? And I'm going to make, I'm going to make an example of something that was said here in church a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. that God is not the God of, um, not secondhand, um, uh, uh, leftovers. Yes. Got you. Um, and in our context, there's nothing like leftover. Yeah. Um, because in our context, because of where we find ourselves, if I, I, I give Tiamo this jacket, it will be appreciated, it will be used. It's not, yeah. um, it's not like, um, sure. you know, how do, we, how do we enrich the ideas that we engage with with and um, so that they meet the context better. Yeah. Secondly, you just spoke about um, the gospel in community or, or grace in community, but how do you also avoid um, doing gospel in such a way that ultimately we, be, we become, um, I don't want to say bodyguards, um, not bodyguards, sorry, 
I had a word in my mind and it slipped. Um, but we, 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 no, let me leave it there. Because, but but we, 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 we're like the police. We police, we police the practice of gospel or lack of practice of gospel mm -hmm. by, by, by what, 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 time, what tends to appear as the hierarchy of sins that we, we not intentionally designed or speak about, but if we do create hierarchies of sin. Yeah. Um, but how do you make sure that we don't police yeah. the gospel? And that's a, um, we're, not, we're, we're trying to get away from um, being legalistic, but at the same time, we do become legalistic in, in, in some of the things that we say in practice. Thanks. Yeah, your first question, great. How do, how do, we, how do we get a, a bigger view? That's how I heard it. How do I get a bigger view of, of uh, the outworkings of theology instead of like one particular view, which I was go, I'd go f as far as to say like a Western view. Can I say that? Is that safe? Okay, cool. Um, one, just read more. <clears throat> um, we, we just need to read more because the content is out there. I get it. Uh, and I actually said this in a, in a comment uh, recently. Someone asked me to read a book uh, they, it's on diversity and they thought it was great and someone had just written it. And, and my question was, um, is it available on Audible? Because we're definitely not gonna get it. Um, I just, I'd, publishers aren't necessarily thinking of developing countries when content is being produced, right? So they're not thinking about the distribution of their content, that's one, but they're also not interested in terms of hearing from those contexts. And I believe that to be true um, be, because it's a, it's a financial, Reality, like, am I going to make a lot of money from reading a book that was written by a theologian uh, in, I don't know, Ghana somewhere? Like, th they're thinking through those things, and, and these are conversations that I've had with um, with publishers. So, so, so that is a real reality because then what we end up having is just uh, tons of content that comes from maybe one particular stream, um, but that doesn't mean that other streams are not like that content is not available, it may be just a little bit harder to get. Because even as I think about this very continent, the theologians that have come before us from this continent, it's insane. The, 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 the theology, and we'll unpack it at some point, but the theology, the doctrine of the Trinity comes from here, comes from this continent. Now, other folks took it and ran with it, right? Like, like John Calvin took it and I mean, he read the work and he ran with it and he built this thing and, and so like we know him and a lot of people would quote him for that, but, but it comes from here. That God has been doing so much work on this continent, like long, long, long before we could ever think or imagine. Um, so there's richness that comes from here and we need, to, we need to mine that richness. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing is we are all theologians and so in this very room, there are people with tremendous gifts. And so how do we, how do we unleash those gifts? How do we, how do we, like there's people here who have the ability to write and, and wisdom and discernment because the Holy Spirit gives all those things. And so how do we create spaces where we're able to unpack some of those things? The doctrine will never change, but how it's practiced and how we understand it, that becomes super, super helpful. And then giving grace, because that's the other thing that we lack is grace. Um, I, I, and I'll admit this, when I came to faith, I was one part of that, that group that, that would just say, um, well, let me say it this way, there are tons of practices that happen on this continent that are amazing, and I believe God goes, that is a beautiful thing. But also, there are tons of practices that are unbiblical, and we need to call, like, we need to know the distinction Call out that which is unbiblical, celebrate that which is like, man, this is just part of God's goodness to us. What ends up happening is when someone comes from a context that is not familiar to ours and sees it, has not done the work of understanding why this is being done and what this means, it's easier just to throw this doctrine as a blanket over it and then nullify everything that happens underneath. And so out of my very mouth, I've said and have repented of it, Oh man, those people who believe in ancestral worship, you're just dumb, so dumb. Now, ancestral worship is wrong, it's unbiblical, it's not from God. Saying that with what I said about those people doesn't give me the opportunity to understand like, hey, what, what's going on here? Because if you read the Bible, especially the Old Testament, you always hear the father of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. 
So, so I'm, I'm recognizing my ancestors, even in my faith. What does that mean? And so to be able to untangle like, oh, there, there is an honoring of those who've gone before us. That's beautiful. The Bible tells us to do that. But now you cross the line when you enter into worshiping of those who've gone before us. And so I want to be able to say, hey, what, what you're doing is, is beautiful, but you're taking it too far because you're putting your hope in them. Your hope only can be put on Jesus and Jesus alone. And so in that, I'm still talking about the doctrine, but I'm still recognizing like, oh, okay, here's, here's how you've missed it here. Instead of a blanket statement that just nullifies everything and then says, follow this way because this way is the right way. And, and many of us do that and then we do, and then after some time you go, whoa, wait a minute. This, what am I doing? So, so I, 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 would, I would throw all those things into that, um, into that whole thing uh, and, and even bring up the fact that you talk about leftovers. Um, I believe Kenny preached that sermon, one of our elders here. And, uh, and so I don't want to speak too much on it because it was his sermon, but I will speak on what I heard. And, and I believe the point he was making is that we are to always bring kind of our, our best to God. Like God deserves our first and best. Um, John chapter 12, uh, it's the, the, the lady that comes and um, anoints Jesus' feet, pours oil on it. Um, everyone there goes, what on earth are you doing? You know, and, and in that moment she's going, man, I'm, I'm worshiping. Like this, this, is, this is an act of worship for me and I'm giving my everything. Um, in the same way that someone who brings what is considered a small amount, and someone who, like, do you understand? Like it's, for me, I wanna strip away all these calculations that we love to do and just ask the question, is this your first and best? If it's not, then it's leftovers, regardless of what it is. Five cents could be someone's first and best. It's their everything, it's their, it's their because they're going, I'm recognizing that which I'm bringing to, and it's, it's God and he deserves it all. Whereas for some people, 500,000 rand is your leftovers. It just is. Like, that's, that's not, like you've done multiple calculations there and you, you, you've stepped into the place of provision and you've gone, you know, I've got enough here to do X, Y, Z. Okay, now I can give to God. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to go one, one more. Hey, is it okay if we don't sing? I mean, we can, I absolutely want to sing, but I'm also very weary, not weary, very aware of time and, and is that okay? Or, or do you guys still want to sing? <laughs> <laughs> Trust Siamo for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, so my question is Pause, on... two seconds there. What did you say? Four questions. Okay. That's, but ask your question, I'll answer it, and then I'll make a, an announcement afterwards. Go. Okay. Um, so when praying for an unbeliever, especially like people who think that they have faith or like because they know yeah. about God, that they know God, what do you think? I know that God hears every prayer and like technically every prayer is practical, but yeah. how do you pray for unbelievers that it's not like repetitive, like may <clears throat> they know you God or change their heart? like? or what scriptures inform your prayer for unbelievers? Yeah, that's really, really good. It's a great question, very personal one. Um, I said this, I think last week or the week before, I can't remember. Um, we have tons of prayer requests that we make to God and uh, I have no certainty that he will do that which you desire for him to do, but I will pray with you and I will pray in expectation that he will do it. I pray for favor. Like those are the words that come out of my mouth. I'm praying for favor. I'm praying uh, that he would give you what it is that you want. And then if he doesn't, it's because he believes that's not what's best for you and that he will give you what is best for you. I pray that. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that all our prayer requests, I can't with 100% certainty say God will answer, except one. And that is the prayer for salvation. And, and so I pray that God would save those people. And, but they need to, it's not like I can't pray it and then they just, like they need to surrender their lives, right? And so what I say to them is like, look, God loves you more than you could ever imagine. Um, he wants a relationship with you. There is so much that he has in store for you. All you have to do is surrender your life and so will you do it? And so I pray that, I pray um, regularly. Um, be super personal here. We, I know we're recording this, but we'll end it where I ended the, the sermon. Um, my brother, I've been praying for my brother for years. 
Um, my brother, for the longest time, was an atheist. Went to a Roman Catholic church. Uh, some things happened. Um, I think it's, it's safe to say he was never saved. Um, became an atheist. Just looked at the injustice, was that question, the injustice of the church or by the church's hands. And just said, I can't. I can't believe in a God who does this. Um, and so was an atheist. So our conversations were different. And this is why it's also important as theologians to understand the context in which we enter into with the content that we have. I think many of us, we come with content that the context just goes, I don't understand what you're saying to me. And so when I, I'm talking to my brother who's an atheist who goes, I don't believe God. Here I am, if I'm unpacking God's word, he's going, man, that sounds great. I, but I don't think you heard me. I don't believe anything that you have to say here. So, so it's different. So I'm going Romans 1 with him to go, okay, but you believe in the universe. Oh, yes. He marvels in it. And I go, now explain to me, who created all of this? He, Big Bang. And so I go, okay, cool. So what you're saying to me, I'm with you, is that out of chaos comes all this order that we experience. And so we have this whole conversation, and we would have it, you know, regularly, all the time, all the time. And then recently, my brother has moved from an atheist, and I pray the same prayer. It's the same prayer. Pray without ceasing. I pray the same prayer. He moved from being an atheist to being agnostic, which for me is a win, because now it changes the conversation. Now I look at my content as a theologian. I recognize the context, and I go, okay, we're moving from Romans 1. He now believes there is something out there, a greater power. He doesn't believe it's God, but he says there's something out there. Let's chat about that. Now we're in Acts, where Paul speaks to the council. It's a group of guys, and there's a, and the unknown God. That's where my brother is. He's like, there's an unknown something. Let's have a conversation. So the prayer doesn't change. How we engage changes, and it's watching that having enough proximity to the person to recognize the changes. And there's various things that, that impact that. Grief, change of life, uh, this new, new job, new, everything. Like, we, we're, we're those people where it's like, yeah, I believe this and I'll believe it forever. And then something happens, it's like, okay, wait. It's thrown me into a, and that's why our hope is so important because no matter what we go through, we can anchor ourselves in it. Because God never changes. But what people put their trust in outside of God, does. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, my, my tagline would be, the prayer is the same. The circumstances will change. Have enough proximity to that person to recognize those things. Okay, the announcement I want to make is we've gone way over time. Um, I do want to continue if this is of value to you. And so um, I can give the benediction, pray, and release us. Um, and maybe I'll hang out here for a little bit more and if we want to answer any more questions. Was this valuable? I, just, I, I thought of it this week, and I thought, I still want to gather. I still want to unpack God's word. We're small enough where maybe we could do something different, but who knows? This might become a new normal. Um, I, I don't know how. I'll chat to the elders, and we'll figure it out, but I think there's value in this. Is that okay? Okay, benediction. Sorry, guys. I know you had an amazing song for us. Will you sing it next week for us? Yes. The Rooted Band. <laughs> Could you throw up the, uh, the benediction there? Um, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11. Um, I had this as our benediction. We close out every gathering with a benediction. Um, a word that you can take as you go out uh, to the world where you live, work, and play um, to remind you of God's goodness. There are so many commands that we find in God's word. Uh, There's so many things that Jesus tells us to do. But I, I, I'm starting to believe one of, not the, but one of the most important is come to me. He stands. He stands at the, the door of every single human heart and he says, come to me. Just come. That's my prayer for my brother. That's my prayer for those who don't know Jesus is that you, you would hear the voice of Jesus say, come to me, whether it's audible, whether it's through God's word, whether it's through friendships, whether you show up to an event that you didn't want to go to and you hear it, that Jesus is going, come to me. Why? Because there is a life, abundant life with me. 
that there is peace, that there is hope. And so I want to read one of those come to me's. And then I want you to see why. And so I'm going to close this out uh, with this word, and then I'll pray for us. And then if you need to go, please do. If, uh, if you need to stay, I'll hang around. I, and I won't, guys, for real, I won't be hurt if you're like, if everyone leaves. I won't. I know you've got places to be. Um, but hear these words of our Father. Matthew 11, verse 28 says this. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There's a whole sermon here, but take up my yoke and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so Father God, I pray for each and every one of us. Um, if it's for some in here who are coming for the first time ever, we praise you, Jesus, for that. We praise you, Holy Spirit, that you've softened their hearts and allowed them to, to sit and be real and honest with themselves, recognizing that the things that they run to do not give rest the way that you do. I, I think of so many moments just in my own life, Jesus, where, where I, I, think, I, I think if I sit in front of a computer screen and just watch a few shows and that will give me rest, that if I go to some beautiful place with a beautiful view, that that will give me rest. And, and the reality is that for many of those things, it's, it's temporary rest. God, what you give us is eternal rest. And that is made possible by simply responding to the three words, come to me. And so I pray that for each and every one of us. We celebrate those who cross the line of faith. Heaven celebrates. And then God, I pray for those who have crossed the line of faith, who already walk with you, who already have a relationship with you. We are forgetful people, and so it doesn't take too long. In, in, in the panic of life, when, when the, the furnace of life turns up the heat, we turn our eyes from you and we run to the things of the past, believing that they can give us what only you can give us. God, I pray that we would turn from those things, that we would repent, call them out for what they are. They are false idols. And then, Holy Spirit, help us to turn to you. We've just spoken of it. Our, our faith, it's the, the, the means by which we receive. It's faith to go, God, I'm trusting in you. I'm believing in you that you can give me what you say you can give. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so, Father, we thank you for that rest that is found in Christ. Would you send us out with that truth? And would you remind us throughout the week when we find ourselves in places that we shouldn't be, thinking things that we shouldn't be, that our rest is only in you. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks, friends.